open your Bibles up to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read two verses, verses 3 and 23. And my message this morning is entitled, The Signs You're Not Saved. And beloved, this sermon is born out of a lot of experience that I've had with a lot of religious people. And probably you have too. But we need to know what God has to say in His Word. Amen. Because many people are walking around thinking they're saved when the fact of the matter is they're really not saved. Not according to the Bible. Not the biblical way. The signs, you're not saved. Let's all stand up please to the reading of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3, and then we're going to drop right down to verse 23. First Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse number 3. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, or a living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Drop down to verse 23. Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. This is the word of God, which, is, which by the gospel is preached unto you. I was thinking about it this morning. I said, instead of those two verses, I think I'm going to read the rest of that, because last week I preached to you about the sperma, the seed of the incorruptible Word of God that's implanted in us. Amen? Our message this morning, the signs, you're not saved. Our Father and our God, we're so grateful to be able to stand in thy presence on this wonderful Sabbath morning. Lord, as we delve into this subject, we pray, Father, that you'd pour out your Spirit that you'd grant us the understanding, Lord God, that we'd examine ourselves, and those watching by television, those watching by YouTube, those who get the DVDs and the CDs, Father, that you'd open up the eyes of their understanding also, so we may make sure that we all come to know Jesus as our blessed Savior and Lord. Father, I pray that you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Now, for the fast two weeks, I've preached on how to know that you're saved. And today, beloved, I want to speak on an even more important subject. You say, really, Pastor? The signs that you're not saved. Why? So we can wake up and now get saved. I can't tell you what the devil has done to me this week trying to put this message together. I can't tell you. You wouldn't believe it. The signs you're not saved. You know, beloved, a Bono poll taken recently showed that statistically over 70% of Americans claim to be born-again Christians. Of course, this is not actually, nor is it factually true, for if it were, America would be in a great revival and not in the sinful moral and spiritual mess and corruption and chaos that it's now in. Amen? There's no possible way 70% of the population of the United States of America can be true born-again Christians. There would be a revival like you read about if there was. But I want to direct my message today, beloved, not to the general unsaved, unreligious population at large, although they also need, need to hear this message. Why? Because they need to be saved. Even though they're not even thinking about God, God's thinking about them. They need to be saved. Amen? But more specifically, I want to direct my message to those religious folks in Christendom who say that they are born again. Now this is important, beloved, because many people occupy the pews in the church week after week thinking they're saved when they're really not saved according to what the Word of God has to say. Not Pastor Joel, not you, but according to the Word of God. I'm speaking to those Christians who claim to be Christians and profess to be saved. I'm speaking to those Christians who go to church week after week and they profess to be saved. I'm speaking to those Christians who are baptized, perhaps as an infant, or perhaps somewhere along the way they got baptized and they take the sacraments and they profess to be saved. I'm speaking to those Christians who say that they are genuinely born-again believers in Jesus, even though they don't know what it means, but nevertheless they profess that they are saved. And I'm speaking to those who are religious, those who are spiritual. I'm speaking to those who may pray and read their Bible and study their Bible, beloved. And they profess, I am a Christian or I wouldn't be doing that. 
And I'm speaking to those who celebrate the Christian holidays. They love to go to church on Christmas. Or they love to go to church on Easter. In fact, most religious people only go to church on those two days, Christmas and Easter, right? <laughs> they don't go week after week. And beloved, I'm speaking of those Christians who like to read Christian books. Or they like to read, read religious books. I've had so many people over the years say, have you ever read this book? Have you ever read that book? None of them, beloved. As I look at them and I read the author, and I, I look at them and I say, oh, my Lord, help me. Help them. In other words, beloved, what I want to speak to today is about nominal Christians. Those who may be as religious as a turkey at Thanksgiving who profess faith in Christ, but in reality do not actually possess genuine saving faith in Christ. Yet, beloved, they think that they do. Many of us have witnessed the people over and over again, and they say, well, that's good for you. I'm a Christian, even though I'm not a born-again Christian. Well, let me tell you something, beloved. There's no such thing as a born-again Christian. You have to be born again before you become a Christian. Amen? And so, beloved, I'm speaking to those who think that they're saved, but they don't possess this genuine faith in Christ. Why? Because they're self-deceived. Why? Because they're so stuck in their own denomination or their traditions or they're stuck in their own beliefs. Why, Pastor Joel? Because many of them are so unreachable and unteachable, beloved. They, don't, they think they already know everything, but they wrongly assume that they're saved when they're not. And yet because of their ignorance of what the scriptures actually teach about being saved, they become blind to it. And consequently, those people who are blind to the Bible way are lost. One of the primary reasons that the Lord Jesus Christ founded the church, beloved, was to fulfill the Great Commission, to preach the gospel to every creature on this earth so they could come to know Jesus as Savior, so they could be born again. Would you say amen? Now hear me, beloved, because I want you to pay close attention to this. During the time of Christ's ministry, the children of Israel were deeply, deeply religious, were they not? During the time of Christ's ministry, the children of Israel, beloved, faithfully attended synagogue. In other words, they went to church every week. Uh, the, the children of Israel, beloved, regularly worshipped God at the temple. During the time of Christ's ministry, the children of Israel, literally, beloved, believed in the prophets and they memorized the scriptures. To get bar mitzvahed, you had to memorize the Decalogue, the first five books of the Bible. Now, can you imagine what was spent doing that, beloved, and thinking, if I can do this, surely God's hand's upon me. Surely I must be saved. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah, Elohim, Yehovah, Akkad. That's the Shema. Listen, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Every time they left their home, they kissed their hand and hit the mezuzah that had that scripture rolled up inside of it. Every time they came home, they kissed their hand and hit it, went into the house. Religious, Amen. Saved, uh-uh. Sad, isn't it? Sad, isn't it, beloved? Yep, despite all this, beloved, all this religious activity, most of the children of Israel also rejected Christ as their Messiah, as their Savior, as their Lord, and were lost because they were not born again, albeit they still thought they were saved. Like many religious people today are. Are you born again? Oh, well, no, but I, I'm a Christian. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying, sure, they were circumcised as a sign that they were included in the Old Covenant, just like nominal Christians will get baptized as an infant, and they're saying, now that includes me in the New Covenant, so I must be saved. And sure, beloved, they were racial Jews, they were ethnic Jews, they were the descendants of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of the, uh, the uh, Jewish fathers in Israel. And sure, beloved, they were part of the chosen people, the chosen nation of God. But this did not guarantee their salvation as they wrongly assumed it would. In other words, their misplaced faith and trust in these things caused them to reject Christ as their Messiah and their need to be born again, to be saved, to ever see or enter in to the eternal kingdom of God. Yet, beloved, despite all their racial advantages, Despite all of their religious advantages and beliefs that they had, beloved, the children of Israel, most of them were then, most of them are now, and most of them will yet be lost forever. What a sad fact that is. 
And that also applies to those who are nominal Christians, by the way. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in Romans 9.27, quoting the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 10.22, made this sad and this staggering statement, beloved. He said, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Or only a remnant shall be saved. Can you imagine that, beloved? How many pebbles in the sand of the sea and only a remnant of them would be saved? Just a little bit. Now these are the words of God speaking to the prophet Isaiah, speaking to the apostle Paul. Why, beloved? Why is that true? Why would only a remnant be saved? Because of their unbelief in Jesus as the Messiah and their adamant refusal to be born again and experience the new birth. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying, listen up, all you nominal Christians out there who are religious but have never truly been born again. This message is especially for your benefit. Listen to me, kids. You're not saved because your mom is saved or your daddy saved or you live in a home that's saved, beloved. You need to have a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the day's going to come when the door of God's probation will slam shut on the hinges of his mercy and nobody can get saved anymore. So don't push it, kids. Come to Christ now. Amen. Now, beloved, I want you to know this. This message today is not to condemn you, but hopefully it's to convict and convert you. Why? So you truly indeed become a born-again child of God and on your way to heaven. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, the Bible says God wants all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, beloved, the Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the fact of the matter is all are not going to do it. Many are going to perish. That's a sad fact, beloved, but it's not because God doesn't want them saved. It's because they don't want to get saved. And I'm going to explain some things to you uh, on that in the sermon. Now, beloved, as I was reviewing this, I said, you know, I could take these people to all over the place, show them all kinds of scriptures, but normally when you do that, you lose the congregation. What happens is you're in John, and they're still trying to find Matthew. Or you're in Genesis, and they're looking in John. So what I've tried to do is this. I've tried to... Instead of going to a lot of scriptures, beloved, and going to all these places and try to prove my points, I'm going to work just out of the book of 1 Peter, and I'm going to use what he, that is he, Peter the Apostle, both explicitly teaches, but also implicitly teaches. In other words, the implications that he alludes to when we read a text. We may not see it explicitly on the text, but there is an implicit teaching that goes along with it. Would you say amen out there? So I want you to see four truths regarding the signs you're not saved. And I want you to listen carefully, and I want you to listen closely. I'm probably preaching to the choir in our church. But remember, we have a much bigger audience just than our church. Why do I want you to listen carefully and uh, uh, closely? Because your eternal destiny in heaven or hell depends on it. Beloved, this is no game. Jesus' death on the cross was real. To save men. And not either you're going to partake of it or you're not going to partake of it. So this is something you just can't brush off. When I say you, that's an editorial you. That includes me, you, and everybody else that may hear this message. Saved or unsaved. So the first thing I want you to see is this. One of the signs that you're not saved is if you had no personal regeneration experience in your life. You've had no personal experience regeneration experience in your life. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 23 again. Peter says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 23, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, beloved, in verse 3 and in verse 23, they use the same Greek word for the two phrases, begotten us again and being born again. Anagoneo. That's the word that Peter is using right here because they mean the exact same thing, namely this. 
It means to be born again. It means to experience the new birth. That is, when a sinner repents and believes the gospel and places their faith in Christ and gets baptized into Christ, God, in His great mercies, by the supernatural power of His Holy Spirit, regenerates him. Now, what do you mean by that, regenerates him? That's a good question. I mean, God's going to impart to you His his DNA, amen? His divine DNA. Meaning their once spiritually dead soul, their once spiritually dead spirit, miraculously, now becomes alive again, beloved. And they are morally and spiritually born anew from above by the incorruptible seed of the word of God, the gospel, by the supernatural means of Christ's resurrection from the dead. In other words, the same power that resurrected Christ from the dead is the same power that's in the word of God, and it's the same power that's in the gospel that regenerates you. Would you say amen? So if we believe that Jesus rose again from the dead through the power of God, then we can believe that the word of God has the same power in it to regenerate your soul. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God supernaturally changes them into a brand new creature with a brand new nature, with a brand new life that's now being supernaturally conformed, listen to me, both into and to do the will of God. I quote this to you many times, but 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature, a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, 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 all things have become new. Did you hear that? Not a few things have become new. What did he say? All things have become new. Now, beloved, through this supernatural transformation of regeneration, Peter says here they're born again unto a lively or a living hope, zao el peace. That is, now they have a confident and certain expectation that God has indeed given them eternal salvation. That God has indeed given them eternal life and the promise of forever living with him in the eternal kingdom of God in heaven with a brand new glorified body fashioned like unto Christ's glorious body. Would you say amen? This is exactly what Peter is teaching us here. And that's why Paul said in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, for our conversation uh, is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that will be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he's even able to subdue all things unto himself. Now I believe that. How about you? I believe that I'm going to resurrect some. If I were to die, drop dead right now, I know that someday God will give me a brand new body and I'm looking forward to it. How about <laughs> All of you say, you got the white flag up, right? Amen, Pastor, right? Look like it's snowing in here. Now, you say, okay, Pastor Joel, I understand all this, but what's your point? What's your point, Pastor Joel? What are you driving at? What's all this got to do with the signs that you're not saved? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? And I'm glad you asked, beloved. And my answer is this. Everything. Everything, I said. It has everything to do with the signs that you're not saved. You see, beloved, being born again is a radical, supernatural experience that happens in a person's life, like falling head over and heels in love with someone, beloved. Inside, you definitely and emotionally know when it happens. There's no doubt about it. My father used to say, love is like an abscess. It hits you right square in the buttocks, and it spreads all over. And that's exactly true. When you fall in love, you do stupid things, don't you? I mean, I I, I, want to see you tonight, honey. But you live five states away. Oh, that's nothing. I'll just take a little drive. (laughs) You see, beloved, when you fall in love like that, you know, you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that something has happened. Amen? What am I saying to you? I'm saying born again is a supernatural event. It's a supernatural experience, ladies and gentlemen, that you definitely know happened to you, and your baptism as a penitent believer testifies this to you. In other words, you definitely know that when you repented and believed the gospel, you definitely know that when you confessed your sins in Christ as your personal risen Lord and Savior, you definitely know that when you got baptized into Christ with the remission of sin and received the indwelling gift 
and the baptism and the seal of the Holy Spirit that something radical happened deep inside you, beloved, and it changed you for sure. You know that you know that you know that you know, even though you may not be able to verbalize it yet. Just like love. If I were to say to you, tell me what love is, I'd have a million different answers, wouldn't I? <laughs> but if you've ever experienced it, truly experienced it, you know what it means. Amen. I've been with my bride now for four, going on 54 years. You're getting old, Dolly. Oh, I better watch out. I'll be sleeping on the couch tonight or in the doghouse. What am I saying, Tim? I'm saying you know you're not the same person that you were before. You know, beloved, that when you contritely repented and prayed and consciously asked Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, something happened. I'm saying, beloved, you can't have a supernatural event like this happen to you. You can't have a simple supernatural experience like this happened to you, you can't have a supernatural encounter with a living God like this happen to you and you don't know it. You see, beloved, yet myriads of folks who claim to be Christians have never had this born against experience, yet they say that they are Christians. In other words, beloved, if you were to ask them when they were born again, they'd say, I don't know, but I'm a Christian. And if you were to ask them uh, how they got saved, they'd say, I don't know, but you know what? I'm a Christian. And if you were to ask them, beloved, what it means to be born again, they'd say, well, I don't know what that means, but I'm a Christian. I can tell you that. And if you were to ask them, how does a person even get born again or get saved? And what does it mean to repent and believe the gospel? they say, I don't know what that means, but I know I'm a Christian. No, you're not. You may not be able to theologically express what happened to you, but you should be able to say something radically and supernaturally happened to me. Would you say amen out there? Now listen to me. If you were to stand outside of most churches on any given Sunday and ask the people leaving the service if they were Christians, they'd say a resounding, unequivocal, and confident, yes, I'm a Christian. Beloved, I used to do that. I can remember one time I was soul winning. I had walked along the waterfront, gone to different places, walked up the, uh, the street by Program Hall, and they were just all getting out of St. Peter's. And a lot of people know me. Hi, Pastor Joe, how are you? I said, oh, no, Lord, you put it right into a harness nest now. So the first thing I said to them, because they had come out of this service, is, uh, are you born again? No, but I'm a Christian. And I said, well, you can't be a Christian unless you're born again. Well, I'm a Catholic. Or whatever denomination. Beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. That they say, I know I'm a Christian because I believe there's only one true God. Hey, you know what? James 2.19 says, the devils, the demons also believe that there's one God and they tremble. At least they tremble. Okay, okay, but you ask them, are you born again? No, they say, but I'm a Christian. And beloved, they say, I know I'm a Christian because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And then you ask them, but are you born again? No, but I'm a Christian. You see, Christ is preached in a lot of churches, isn't he? Is it the true Christ? Is it the real Christ? Is it another Christ? Oh, they say, you know, I'm, I know I'm a Christian because I pass my confirmation and I go to Mass and I, I go to confession at least once a week. Okay, but are you born again? No, no, I'm not, but I'm a Christian. Hey, you know what? I got baptized as an infant. I mean, I took confirmation, passed my confirmation, passed my communion. I did all of that. Okay, you did it. But are you a Christian? No. Uh, uh, are you born again? No, no. But I know that I'm a Christian. You see, beloved, a lot of them say, I know I'm a Christian because I pray to God. I pray the rosary. I pray and say uh, novenas. I pray to Mary and the saints. I pray all of these things. I read my Bible. I read Christian books. So therefore, I, I must be a Christian. But are you born again? No, but I'm a Christian. You see, beloved, you hear me now. None of these things make you a Christian, and if you were a true born-again Christian, you wouldn't do half of the things that I just said to you. Because you know that they're not biblical. Amen? Mary can't save you. The saints can't save you. Pastor Joel can't save you. The Pope can't save you. The Cardinal, the Canary, or any other bird can't save you. 
You know, beloved, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but suffice it to say, beloved, Jesus said that you must, he was emphatic, you must be born again to ever see and enter into the kingdom of God. And then Jesus said, marvel not that I said unto you, you must, in verse 8, you must be born again. If you uh, uh, ever want to enter in, you must, he says, be born of water and of the Spirit to be saved and be a true Christian. And beloved, unless and until you are born again like this, you will be lost and you will never see or enter into the eternal kingdom of God. In other words, you can't do it your way like Frank Sinatra. You must do it God's way, no way, or the highway, or the hell way. Amen? Amen? And beloved, it saddens me to have to preach this message, and I believe that's one of the reasons Satan has been ragging on me all week. Because people are being snatched like a brand out of the fire. And Lord, thank the Lord this will go forth long after I'm pushing up daisies. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter said this to the Sanhedrin, to the children of Israel, beloved, imagine, standing on the steps of the temple, He says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none under name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Notice how emphatic, how dogmatic both Jesus and Peter were when they said you must be born again. In other words, it's an absolute necessity to have the experience, the new birth, beloved, if you ever want to be saved and you want to go to heaven. Amen? So no matter how much you say you're saved, no matter how much you feel you're saved, no matter how much you believed you're saved, you are not saved unless and until you're born again, beloved, then and only then, once you're born again, now you become a true Christian. Come on and say amen. And that's why Isaiah said, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. Yet their hearts circumcised by the Holy Ghost Now listen carefully, beloved. To be a true born-again Christian and saved, then you must personally experience a supernatural regeneration by the Holy Spirit in your soul. Then you must personally experience being born again. You must experience personally having that new birth. You're not a Christian because you feel like you're saved or because you've had visions and people have said, I've had these apparitions that have appeared to me. Or I've had these religious experiences, beloved. If you can't pinpoint a specific time in your life when you personally repented of your sins and believed the gospel, if you can't pinpoint a specific time in your life, beloved, when you personally paced your faith in Christ alone as your Lord and Savior, if you can't pinpoint a specific time in your life when you personally were baptized as a penitent believer, then this biblically shows that you've had no true personal regeneration experience in your life yet, that you've had no personal uh, conversion experience in your life yet, and you've had no salvation experience in your life yet. You see, beloved, and this means that you're also not a true Christian yet. Now, if you connect the dots, it all makes sense when you look at it according to the Word of God. Amen? I'm saying, sure, you may be religious. Sure, you may be pious. Sure, you may be a Bible reader and feel like you're a Christian. But this does not biblically make it so. Beloved, I want you to picture the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. I'm not going to elaborate on it because Dave, I know, has got a second part to this. Only to say this, beloved. That Jesus sternly warns those who profess and confess to be Christians that when he returns, he's going to say to them that they really aren't. Now can you imagine, beloved, Jesus says this, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not then done many wonderful works in thy name. And I will profess unto them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. But kurios, kurios, Lord, Lord, that's the word that they're using. They were calling him the Lord Jesus. They believed in the Lord Jesus. In fact, biblically, uh, or contextually, beloved, Jesus was preaching amongst the Jews. He was eating with them and all of that. And he preached to all of them, right? We know who you are. 
And they followed them for a while, some of them, didn't they? But you see, beloved, I want to tell you something. It's not him who begins the race that gets the crown. It's him that finishes it. And it's a tough race. Beloved, I don't say this boastfully, honestly, honestly. I say this, I'm a, I'm a disciplined person. This is the toughest thing I've ever done in my life, being a Christian. I can do a lot of things, even at my old age. Oh, I don't know about today. But, but beloved, I can tell you this. Being a Christian and staying a Christian and running in the race and trying to be faithful is the toughest thing I have ever personally done in my life. So what are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying this. That was a serious and a sober warning to professing Christians who've truly not been born again. Now listen to me. By doing the will of God to be saved. In other words, if I want to be saved, I have to do it according to God's will. Amen? To do the will of God. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, no one and though a lot of people think this happens, just drifts into the kingdom of God. No one, ladies and gentlemen, who thinks uh, like the, or thinks their way into the kingdom of God or just wakes up one day and says, you know what, I believed in Jesus all my life. So didn't I. I can't remember a day I didn't pray. I'd come home half cocked <laughs> and I'd get on my knees and I'd pray. But a lot of people say, you know, I believe in Jesus all of my life, and, I th and so I think this means I must be saved. I mean, I, I just feel that, that that must be what born again means. And even though I haven't done it the biblical way, God knows my heart. Indeed, he does. And he said, you must be born again. Amen? He didn't say you should be born again. He didn't give us a, an option of being born again. He's saying, if you want to come into my kingdom, if you want to live with me forever, then you must, you must, you must be born again. Come on and say amen. Then you must be born again. Beloved, sadly, many religious Roman Catholics feel like this. And sadly, many religious Greek Orthodox feel like this. And sadly, many religious Protestants and Episcopalians and Congregationists feel like this. And beloved, sadly, many evangelicals feel like this. Good people, yes. Sincere people, yes. Religious people, yes. Saved, no. Lost, yes. Uh-huh. How can that be? I'm so religious. So beloved, if you've had no personal regeneration experience in your life, then this is one of the first clear signs that you know you are not saved and you need to be. And I implore you, I beseech thee, I beg with you to do that. Accept Christ as your Savior. You say, I'm not ready yet. You're never going to be as ready as you think the devil tells you you have to be. I'll wait till I clean up my life. Oh, beloved, you can't clean up your life. God cleans it up. Amen? So that's point number one, beloved. You've had no personal regeneration experience in your life. Point number two, you've had no pious repentance expressed in your life. You've had no pious repentance expressed in your life. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 13 through 16. Now remember, beloved, not only am I teaching you what's explicit on the text, but implicit at what it's alluding to. Peter says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And the writer of Hebrews says, No man without holiness will ever see God. Now, beloved, here... Peter alludes to the actions of a penitent believer, that they are, have a proclivity or a bent to live holy. Now the word repentance, metanoia, metanoia, say that word. Metanoia, the Greek word, means that your conscience now feels such deep sorrow, such deep guilt and remorse for your sins, that you have a change of mind toward them, that leads you to have a change of heart toward God, that leads you to get saved and ultimately now have your radical change of life, that you start living a holy, righteous, and godly life for God. Because God is in you now. The Holy Spirit is in you now. He's given you a new nature, new beliefs, new convictions. Would you say amen out there? 
So, beloved, repentance is you turning away from sin and turning to God. Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul said. Repentance is you doing a 180 degree turn in your life. You're turning away from your sin. You're turning away from this evil world system. And now you're turning towards God because you want to do, you want to live holy for God. Repentance, beloved, is you now radically changed from being a worldly sinner to being a worshiping saint of God. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying here, Peter implies how the penitent sinner who's been supernaturally changed by God into a pious saint is to turn away from the world and persevere in the faith and live a holy life in obedience to God's commandments that's looking for the fullness of God's grace that will be brought to him by the revelation of Jesus Christ at the second advent. Trying to sum it all up in all those verses, okay? That's what Peter is saying. He's talking about the repentant life. Amen? Now, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. No repentance, then no supernatural regeneration. No repentance, then no supernatural conversion to Christ. No repentance, then no salvation, no eternal life. You see, beloved, belief in Jesus without repentance of heart and life is like a car without tires. It goes nowhere. It just stays right there. You can rev the engine all you want. You can listen to it. You can turn the radio on, but you're going to, well, you're going to stay right there. <laughs> That's Portuguese. These people don't know the heavenly language yet. In other words, beloved, I'm saying it's useless. You, useless. Useless. It's worthless is what I'm saying. Faith without repentance and change of heart and life is not true saving faith. John the Baptist said this, beloved, in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8. He said this, that we're to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Now notice he didn't say singular there, did he? He didn't say bring forth a fruit, meat for repentance. He said bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. In other words, there has to be a lot of fruit now. Something's happened inside of you. There has been repentance toward those things you don't want to do anymore, and now you're starting to do the things that God wants you to do. In other words, he's saying bring forth proof and evidence that you've had a real change of heart and mind and life to now want to live for God. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 3, verses uh, 13, verses 3 and 5. Jesus said, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Beloved, notice how all-inclusive that word is. Except unless you repent, he said, you will all likewise perish. Just like in Noah's day, only eight survived. Just like Lot and his daughters were brought out of Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities of the plain, only they survived. And just like the remnant in Israel, only they will survive. You know, the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Paul said this, Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. Now let me just give you a little insight into what he's saying there. Godly sorrow, he means contrition. That is having genuine remorse for your sins that you've sinned and transgressed against God's law. That's called contrition. What's it called? Say it again. Contrition. Say it again. Contrition. You get remorse. Lord, I'm so sorry I sinned against heaven. How could I have done it? See, that, Paul says that's godly sorrow, and godly sorrow will bring you salvation. Amen? But, beloved... There's also uh, 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 worldly sorrow. But let me just say one other thing as I'm thinking of it right here regarding godly sorrow, beloved. The Bible teaches that when we get saved, we don't just repent one time. The Christian is to live in a constant and continuous state of repentance. In other words, we're going along in our life and we do something we know we shouldn't do or say or we sinned against God, then we stop and we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, you know the text, I don't have to quote it to you. So we live in a constant state of repentance. It isn't a once-for-all deal like a lot of people try to make it today. Now, beloved, what do I mean by worldly sorrow? It's just the opposite of godly sorrow. In other words, worldly sorrow is attrition. What is it? Attrition, not contrition. begins with an A. What is it? Attrition, meaning this, ladies and gentlemen. 
you're sorry that you got caught in your sin and that you have to pay the penalty, but you have no remorse that you sinned against God or broke his law. In other words, you got caught with your hand in the cookie jar and you're going to pay the penalty for it. That's attrition. I'm sorry that I got caught. I'm sorry that I might have to go to jail, but I'm not sorry I sinned against God. Beloved, if there's no worldly sor- I mean, godly sorrow under repentance, you'll never be saved. Would you say amen? And so what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this. Yet yeah, This is what many folks in Christendom have, and it won't save them. And this is a clear sign that you're not sp- saved. They don't have any godly sorrow. They have worldly sorrow. But, oh, Mom, oh, Dad, you don't know. I, this is what's going to happen to people. And so Mom and Dad try to bail them out instead of letting them face the consequences and let them see that there's a penalty to pay when you do the wrong thing. Experience is the best teacher, isn't it? Now, speaking of his disciples, Jesus said some three times, beloved, in John chapter 15, verse 9, And then in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 14, and John 17, 16, he said of his disciples that they are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. In other words, we get translated out of this world, amen, and into the kingdom of God. When we get saved, Jesus translates it. He literally takes us out of the world, this kingdom of darkness, brings us into the kingdom of light and the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord, beloved. And then Satan, the god of this evil world system, the prince of the power of the air, who rules over this morally and spiritually and abysmally dark and damned and doomed domain. He no longer has control or power over us. Now we can resist his temptations. Amen. And now, beloved, we can do the will of God because God wants us to do it. We're free to serve the Lord. However, beloved, one of the signs that you're not saved as you claim to be a Christian, but you still feel perfectly at home in this world. In other words, you want Jesus, but you don't want to separate from the world. Beloved, listen to me. Please listen to me. Dear God of heaven, listen to me. You can't have both. Either you're going to give it up, or God's going to give you up. You can't have the world, and you can't have Jesus to boot. And if you feel at home in the world and you claim to be a Christian and you refuse to separate, beloved, I mean, you still act like the world, you still talk like the world, you still dress like the world, you still party like the world, you still get drunk like the world, you still take drugs like the world and smoke like the world and fornicate like the world and participate in sinful pleasures like the world, beloved. All of these things are contrary to the word, will, and ways of God. And I'm not saying this to you to get you mad. I'm saying this to you so you can get saved if you're not saved. A lot of Christians, quote, nominal Christians claiming to be born again are doing all of those things and thinking still they're going to grace the doors of God's heaven when the fact is they won't. They are willfully disobeying the word of God. That's rebellion against God. They vexed his Holy Spirit as the children of Israel did in Isaiah 63.10. And the Bible says he left them and turned to be their enemy. And you don't want that to happen to you, do you? You see, beloved, I'm saying these sinful things grieve. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Bible says they vex and they insult and they quench the voice of the Holy Spirit, especially those who claim, I am saved. Well, if you've got the Holy Spirit of God inside you, beloved, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit and you can do those things and not have any remorse, any conviction whatsoever, you had better check your salvation. Amen? Because there's no way the Holy Spirit will turn you upside down until you either listen up or you say, I don't want to hear you anymore. So you... Beloved, well, what I'm saying is this here. You can't do unchristian things like that and still think because you believed in Jesus one time or you believe in Jesus that so you're going to walk right into the kingdom of heaven. You know, beloved, none of us like confrontation. None of us like to fight. I don't like to fight. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. As long as I've got strength in me, I'm going to fight for my soul. And nobody's going to fight for your soul like you. And if you're not fighting for your soul, now is the time to start doing it. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Amen? Not lay around and lay hold on eternal life. 
He said, fight, agonizomai, fight, strive. Because, beloved, let me tell you something. Satan, the god of this evil world system, is telling you, don't worry about it. You're okay. Reach for all the gusts that you can right now, and then when it, if you die, well, if it happens, it happens. Beloved, you will never say that. Once you die, that, that second you die, you open your eyes, God will have his angels escort you into the burning, boiling, bubbling pit of hell, and you'll scream for eternity. Jesus said they'd be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. He said, your worm would not die. And in Isaiah 66, verse 24, the Bible says in the new earth there'll be a gaping hole where we can look into it with all the unsaved are screaming and it's burning. And the Bible says their worm dieth not. That'll be a reminder. We make sure we use our free will right when we enter the kingdom of God. Amen. You know, beloved, if you're living like that, you're either not saved or you are a backslider and you are no longer saved. The Apostle John said this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I can't make that any clearer. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? I shouldn't even have to interpret that. So if you're here today, and you say you're a born and green Christian, you love the world, refuse to separate from the world, you are contrary, you're doing exactly what's 180 different than what the scripture tells you to do. You see, beloved, James chapter 4.4 4 says this, Know ye not, are you so ignorant of this fact, that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. How clear can you get? How much clearer can you get? If you're chumming with the world, running with the world, doing all that, God says you are an enemy of God. So beloved, if there's no repentance, if there's no change in your life, that is a sign you're not saved. Number three and number four, I'm going to make them quick. You have no personal reformation experience in your life. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Peter says, for as much then. Now, beloved, in the original, in the Greek manuscripts, there's no versification nor the chapter breakdowns. For as much then, as I've been saying in verse 22, who has gone into heaven, is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers, being made subject unto him, that is good and bad angels, being made subject unto him, for as much then, as that is true, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh shows that he hath ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the lust of the flesh to men, but to the will of God. Here, Peter alludes to the reformed behavior that a Christian should show in their life. When he says, arm yourself, beloved, hoplizo, humais, it's a military term. Let me tell you what it means. It means that like a soldier obeys his commander's orders and puts his weapons on to fight against the enemy, Likewise, the true Christian is to put on the whole armor of God and he's to fight against the lust of the flesh so he can cease from sin the rest of his life and do the will of God. That's what Peter is saying here, amen? God says cease from sin, not live in it, not play with it. In other words, beloved, there needs to be a reformation experience in your life. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, I won't quote it all, but he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in that evil day, and having done all, stand. Stand there having your loins girt about with truth and on the breastplate of righteousness and put, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Then he says, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. And then he says, the sword of the spirit, which is your only offensive weapon. He says, praying with all prayer and supplication for the saints. Put on the whole armor of God. So the 
real Christian knows that they have, are in a battle. They're in a spiritual battle. They must put on the whole armor of God. Some of you are going to walk out of this door today. You're just going to forget it. I hope not. Some of you are watching by television. But you're in a battle whether you know it or not. And if you're complacent and indifferent about it, it shows Satan has really got you exactly where he wants in the battle. He's got his foot on your neck. Because, beloved, I want to tell you something. I don't get complacent and indifferent in the battle. I, I, if I go down, I'm going down swinging. Now, there may not be much behind it. <laughs> but, whew, I'm going to throw a swipe at him. How about you? You see, beloved... The question is, have you armed yourself like this? In Colossians 3, 1 through 4, the Bible says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on the things of this earth, for you are dead and your life is here with Christ and God. For when Christ was our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Would you say amen out there? In other words, beloved, look at your life. Do you see that you seek for these heavenly and these spiritual things? Are you always looking at carnal and earthly things? How's the Holy Spirit prompting you? Are you doing those things? So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying if you claim to be a born-again Christian, if you claim that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, beloved, do you see any change in your life? Do you see any transformation or reformation in your life, beloved? If not, and you live the same world, or the same way the world does, then that is a clear sign you are not saved. Now, I have no pleasure in saying that. I'm saying that for your benefit. When I say you are, all of us that are hearing the message. Now, let me give you the fourth point, and I'll make it quick. You have no pursuit of righteousness exhibited in your life. You have no pursuit of righteousness exhibited in your life. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now let me ask you something. What do fleshly lusts do in your life? And you know what? A lot of Christians don't even know that. Or those who claim to be Christian. That's why they live that fleshly life. And you see, beloved, and you can see who's winning the war if you're partaking of these fleshly lusts. Amen? Now, beloved, I want you to go over to chapter 3. Look at what he says in verses 10 through 13. He says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? True Christians, beloved. A true Christian understands that this world is not their home. We sing it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Somewhere beyond the blue, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. I'm going to go on, and Columbia Records wants me to make a record of that next week. Yeah, a broken record. That's <laughs> well, you see, beloved, they understand that this world is not their home. Do you understand that? I do. And the older I get, and the older I get in the Lord, the more and more I understand. In other words, beloved, we are but strangers on this earth. We are pilgrims on this earth. We are sojourners on this earth, just passing through to our eternal home in heaven. Now, beloved, I want you to picture, can you see that little space between my fingers? No, you can't. Now, I want you to look compared to it from those condos next door to the woods next door, that little piece like that. That's the difference in your life and eternal life. Earthly life and eternal life. Your earthly life is a blip on the radar screen of life, and you're going to spend it somewhere. Amen? Just a blip. And this is the only chance you have to come to know the Lord. In other words, beloved, therefore, according to what Peter says here in chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, they know that doing righteousness tends to life, Peter says here. So they try to speak righteously. They try to act righteously. They try to pursue righteousness. They try to live righteously, beloved. 
In other words, Peter says they're followers of good, followers of peace. Why? Because they know that the omniscient eye of God is always watching them. God's always watching, isn't he? Searching. David prayed, search me, O Lord. Try my heart. Try my reins. And see if there be any wicked thing, any secret fault in me. Whereas the mere professor, beloved, could care less about thinking that God is watching him. Yeah, right. Who cares? And they could care less about pursuing good or pursuing peace or pursuing righteousness. Why? Because they're still unrighteous in their words and they're still unrighteous in their works and they're still unrighteous in their witness. You see, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, the Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul said to the church in Galatia, in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth in this life, so shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Would you say amen out there? So what am I saying to you? I'm saying the signs that you're not saved is, number one, you've had no personal regeneration experience in your life. Number two, you've had no pious repentance expressed in your life. You're not living in any state of repentance. Number three, you have no personal reformation experience in your life. Your life is still the same. You won't separate from the world. And number four, you have no pursuit of righteousness in your life that's ever been exhibited. You just do what it is that you want to do. So these are the clear signs that a person is not saved. I get no pleasure in saying that, but hopefully it will wake people up. Amen. Those who watch us on television, YouTube, and the rest, hopefully, uh, I'll never forget, uh, years ago, I had a man, and um, he got my tapes. I don't know how he got them. And he said he was driving through Canada, and he kept hearing me preaching and preaching and he kept hearing that. In fact, I had a woman, my wife will tell you, step in front of our house. She said, you know, are you Pastor Joel? I said, yes, I am. She says, I was driving down the street listening to you. I keep hearing this. So I pulled over. I thought something was wrong with my tire. So I opened up the trunk. She, then I realized it was you pounding the pulpit. <laughs> but this guy went right through Canada. And he said he even missed some of the cutoffs because it's so engrossed in what the sermon was saying. So much so, beloved, that he wrote me a check for $1,000 personally, and I gave it to the church. I don't see that to me. I said, I, I, I'm preaching. I get paid anyways. I said, I'm glad that this helped you. That's the purpose. Remember, God saves men through the foolishness of preaching. Amen. Not the foolishness of teaching, even though you need to be a preacher teacher. Not through the foolishness of singing, even though we love singing, we love songs. It's through the foolishness of preacher. And if you've got a preacher... That's preaching the truth. Satan's going to want to do everything he can to get rid of him. Believe me when I tell you that. The signs you're not saved. Let's go to the throne of grace.